So we're back on the podcast with Dr. Alan Sills, the NFL's medical director, and just, you know, truth in whatever here. We're recording this during Super Bowl week, playing it uh, about 12 days later. So events might take over whatever we talk about, but I doubt it because they're going to be sort of evergreen events about what's going on in the NFL medically. So, Dr. Sills, let's start with something that really kind of got some headlines, and I want to unpack a little bit about what it means. The news that concussions in the NFL in 2022 were up 18% year over year over 2021, and my first thought was that did this have something to do with the fact that concussions are under more of a microscope with more people watching you know from upstairs and there being everybody being a little bit more cognizant that if anybody shows any signs of a concussion that at least immediately they're taken out not that they're necessarily diagnosed with a concussion Mm -hmm. but they're immediately taken out and examined tell me about that aspect of it and what you attribute that uh, increase to? Well, Peter, I think that's part of the explanation, but like most things in medicine, this has a lot of different explanations. So um, it is true that we did more concussion exams this year than we've ever done, meaning we examined more players. And like you said, being examined doesn't mean you were diagnosed. It just means you're being checked. And we still do three to four negative evaluations for every one concussion we diagnose, which is a a number that we're pretty comfortable with, meaning that we're okay having a wide net, if you will. We want to make sure we don't have someone who's injured out on the field. So we did more evaluations than we've ever done. We had more medical timeouts than we've ever done, where a spotter actually stops the game. That happened 33 times this year, which is an all-time record, almost double our previous high. And then, as you know, we made a protocol change during the season where we broadened the definition of concussion uh, after the week four incident with uh, the Miami Dolphins quarterback. So, so I think all of those things added together, and I think we're continuing to see a, an increase in the willingness of players to speak up, coaches to speak up, others to speak up, to, to be evaluated. So I think all those things going together, uh, plus some things in the style of play, probably contribute to that increase. When I think back on this, I think of a real – kind of landmark moment in concussion protocol is when Ben Roethlisberger in a game against the Seattle Seahawks chose to take himself off the field Mm -hmm. in a really competitive close game down the stretch right a lot of eyebrows were raised at that moment about that I thought it was a tremendous thing for Roethlisberger to do quite frankly so do you think right now the unvarnished truth. Are players self-diagnosing and self-reporting more than they have in the past? Absolutely, yes. Unequivocally, yes. I mean, I've been covering events on the sidelines for nearly 30 years, and there's no question that players are much more willing to speak up in all sports, not just in the NFL. I think they understand concussion, they understand the importance of speaking up, and they understand, hey, this is an injury you can play through, right? We talk a lot about toughness in football and people sort of playing through injury. You only get one brain. You know, we can't tape it up and put you back in. So I think no question that players are speaking up more readily. Coaches are speaking up. And again, I know of at least a couple of incidents this year where a starting quarterback in the NFL we won't name names, did speak up and said, hey, you know, I got hit and I don't feel right. I need to get checked out. So we think that's a healthy thing, and and I think it's an important lesson for sports at all levels and particularly for youth sports that people realize, hey, if I got hit and I don't feel right, I need to tell someone so that I can get checked out. Let's move to DeMar Hamlin and sort of the lessons that the NFL has taken from the DeMar Hamlin story. Uh, On January 3rd, obviously everyone knows that um, he was injured in a game and his heart stopped on the field in Cincinnati and he was exceedingly well taken care of on the field and then afterwards at, uh, at a hospital in Cincinnati. As you look back on it now and sort of deconstruct the moment and the NFL's reaction to that moment medically, Mm -hmm. what do you see? Well, Peter, what I see is something that starts many months in advance. I mean, that's a moment that we never want to see, but that we have prepared for for a very long time. You know, it starts with each club submitting what's called an emergency action plan. They write a playbook 
just like our players have a playbook, we have a playbook for what we'll do for a variety of emergencies, and a, and a cardiac emergency is one of those emergencies. And so the clubs all submit that. It gets reviewed by an emergency preparedness consultant, Dr. Jim Ellis, that we use. Um, the league and the player association, we also review it. But then the club goes and practices it, just like the players practice that playbook. They rehearse that. And we actually have third-party companies who come in and watch the medical staff do resuscitations for various events. They film it. They give them feedback. They give them critiques. And so there's a tremendous amount of preparation that goes into it. And so in the moment when that's happening, Peter, I'm expecting and, and watching to see that we're defaulting to what we've prepared for. Because I think it's the Navy SEALs that say in moments of crisis, you don't rise to a level of performance. You sink to the level of your training. And that's what we do. We, we, we default back to what we've trained for. So in this particular case, what worked well granularly in saving DeMar Hamlin's life? It's all about immediate recognition, immediate recognition that there's a life-threatening event and that he became pulseless, immediate defibrillation and CPR. So you got to get CPR started right away, and then you got to have a defibrillator available and have people that know how to use it. And I think that, Peter, is the very key lesson on this. It's not about that we had 30 medical professionals at the game. It's not even about that emergency action plan that I described to you. It's that people there recognized an emergency, were trained to do CPR, and knew how to use a defibrillator. And that's what I hope the lesson is for everyone else is, hey, if I'm a parent or I'm a coach of any kind of athletic event at any age, let's make sure we've got people who are trained in CPR. Let's make sure we have a defibrillator. We know where it is, and we've got people who know how to deploy it. Because, Peter, that saves lives. There's no question that it's all about the time of the response, and that's the, that's the key factor here is how quickly can you defibrillate someone. And isn't it also the case in this particular case that, you know, there's a line of demarcation in the human body that if you are not breathing and if you uh, do not, and if your heart is stopped for longer than, say, a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. you could suffer permanent damage to your brain and to other organs in your body. Absolutely. In medicine, we always say <clears throat> time is tissue. So the, any time that's, that's delayed, that you don't have perfusion, you don't have circulation, tissue is dying, whether that's brain tissue or heart tissue. So the, the fast response is what is immediately uh, is the key element. And that's why you know, I've heard situations where, for example, a, an athlete might collapse at a, at a youth event and the defibrillator is locked away in a school building. You know, that's no good. We gotta have those things immediately available because time is tissue and time is really of the essence here. It's interesting, I had a conversation with a, now he's 31 years old, but when he was a sophomore in high school 15 years ago, um, he had uh, his heart stopped on the field of, of a lacrosse game in Florida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously he doesn't remember what happened, but he said after it was reconstructed to him, he goes, the most important thing that happened is that my coach is a firefighter, mm -hmm. and my coach was basically the equivalent of an EMT on the field mm -hmm. that day, mm -hmm. and that is really what saved my life. Yeah. If it was a bunch of parents coming out of the stands, they wouldn't have known. So I, I wanted to ask you about one other thing that a bunch of the teams in the NFL have done, which I think is fantastic. We've seen the Saints do it, the Packers do it. Mm -hmm. I'm, sh I'm sure I'm missing some that have basically bought uh, defibrillator units. Mm -hmm. What are they called? AEDs, AEDs right? AEDs, right. Yeah. yeah. Bought defibrillator units and are putting them in places, in many, in many cases, uh, y you know, in some lower income areas, mm -hmm. in rec centers and things like that. Right. That you don't know right now maybe whose life is going to be saved by one of these things. Right. But most likely, you're going to hear stories in the coming years of these AEDs saving lives, you know, for young athletes, you know, around the United States? Well, there's no question that they will, and there are a number of other clubs in the league itself, Peter, they're involved in that effort. But to me, that's only part of it. We gotta have AEDs, but you gotta have people that know how to use them. So part of my um, plea and part of our messaging over the coming months will be coaches of all levels of all sports, take a CPR class. I mean, they're easy to find. How long does it do. take to learn CPR? You can do it in an afternoon. Wow. Easily. 
And um, I, I just think that is something, you know, we think of coaches being prepared to teach the game. We even now think of coaches, you need to have basic concussion information. I would add CPR training to that um, because I, I just think it's so critical to, to have responders. You're not going to have a doctor or an athletic trainer at every athletic event. You're just not, um, especially at practices. And think about how many more practices, for example, happen than games in a lot of sports. So if you've got a practice for a youth or high school team, maybe no medical personnel behind or around rather, that's, that's where you need that coach to step forward and, and have basic life support skills. I got two other topics for you in our remaining time. Number one, position-specific helmets. Mm -hmm. um, I, a couple of years ago, I really looked into this, talked to Jeff Miller and several other people at some of these helmet companies mm -hmm. to talk about the position-specific helmets. Now, I have no idea how many concussions that might, whether it's going to reduce the number of concussions. How close is the NFL right now from outfitting players at certain positions with position-specific helmets? And give me an example, like for a quarterback, mm -hmm. what does that mean? How is his helmet going to be different? Yeah, the idea with position-specific helmets is that <coughs> players get concussed in different mechanisms depending on their position. So, for example, quarterbacks tend to get concussed from blows in the back of the head. They're often yeah. throwing the ball. They fall in an unprotected way. They hit the back of their head on the ground. So that's a common head-to-ground mechanism, but involving what we call the occipital area, the back of the head. So when you think about protecting the quarterback, you'd want extra padding, extra support in that area. Um, offensive linemen, on the other hand, tend to get hit in the front of the head, the front of the helmet. And actually this year, Peter, we did have position-specific, offensive lineman-specific helmets available. They're, they're a little bit different shape. They've got yeah. extra padding in the front of the helmet, and we had a few players using them. So position What did they say about them? Do you know? You know, I think the feedback is small numbers, but so far has been good. Obviously, it's, it's not enough players that you yeah. can make a statistical comparison, but, um, but the feedback... Do you believe the, quarterbacks voluntarily will wear these helmets? Absolutely. I think if we have data that shows that they're safer, and I think we are likely to see a quarterback-specific helmet on the market later in 2023 um, and I think it'll in time be, for this year I do I think it's something that many quarterbacks will want to look into I mean it's hard for players to change a helmet they get yeah. used to wearing a helmet but if the data is driving that and that's what's been so good about our effort together with the player association our engineers we've developed this testing methodology as you know and we've been able to show that how those helmets test in the lab has a really good correlation with how they perform on field so I think if the data shows uh, these, <coughs> these helmets indeed look like they're safer I think you'll see players adopting them. People who don't play football, I think, really don't understand a, a player's relationship with his helmet. And I know that sounds weird, but I remember Patrick Peterson, his rookie year with the Cardinals, I had heard that he brought his helmet from LSU with him mm -hmm. to the NFL. And basically, it's almost like the people who love the Second Amendment, you're going to, you know, you're going to have to pry this gun from my hand, <laughs> you know, whatever, uh, from my dead hands or whatever. But, and Patrick Peterson said, I will never not wear this helmet. Now that did change yeah. because his helmet was on the, the, the <laughs> bad on the list, list, the naughty <laughs> list or whatever. But uh, I, I, people love their helmets. And that's sure. why I wonder, especially with quarterbacks, you know, are you going to be able to get comfortable enough yeah. with these new helmets? Maybe Tua Tagovailoa <laughs> will. He'll want to, but well, I wonder if a large number of quarterbacks but, will. But we've seen players make these changes, Peter, based on the data. That's what's amazing. If you look back five years ago, nearly half of the league was wearing a helmet that today we would consider to be substandard. Yeah. You know, it would be below the line on the chart. And, and those players all changed. And now we've seen where in the past couple of years, there are either zero or maybe one player in the whole league who's not wearing one of those top performing helmets. Right. So it is a big deal to change, but I think people are aware that it's about safety and that, and, and players want to be safe. They want to have the, the safest equipment. And so we've seen them make those changes driven by the data and, and driven by a lot of education and conversation. You've probably seen, and because you've been involved in, in some of it, you know, the debate slash disagreement between the Players Association and the league about natural turf fields. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Demoris Smith here at the Super Bowl, the head of the NFLPA, said, pointed to the fact that some teams that wanted to get World Cup games uh, would be willing to change their home fields, at least for the World Cup, to natural grass who now have artificial turf 
And that's because the World Cup demands that all their games be played on grass. Uh, and Demoris Smith said the NFL cares more about Premier League players and World Cup players than they do about NFL players. I assume that sort of chafes you. But what's been your response to that? And what do you think, is it ever going to be possible for every game in the NFL to be played on natural grass? Well, I look at this from a little bit different lens, and that is really from the lens of <clears throat> specific injuries and what's driving those injuries. And so we look at a host of factors for lower extremity injuries, for example, and say, okay, if we want to talk about ACL injury or if we want to talk about ankle sprains, what are the factors that contribute to that? And the surface is one of those factors, but it's not the only factor. It's the footwear, it's the previous injury history, it's the conditioning, it's the load, it's the style of play, it's the position. You know, there are a lot of factors that go into this and they each have sort of different weighting. When you start looking at surfaces themselves, Peter, and again, think of it as not just artificial or natural, but what are the properties of that surface, right? How hard is it? What's the coefficient of friction? You know, what's the thickness? How, how much does it bounce back? How much energy does it deliver back? If you think about it biomechanically, you really start to think about surfaces differently based on those physical properties more so than just you know, blade of grass versus blade of an artificial material. So what we're trying to study and what I'm interested in is what are those properties that really correlate with injury? For example, we could make a really, really slick surface where no one would ever probably tear an ACL, but people would fall down all the time. You know, it'd be an ice skating rink. So you're trying to balance performance and, and then these injury risks and figure out what's that sweet spot. And we need to do that, Peter, not just for artificial surfaces, but for natural surfaces. Because as you can imagine, the grass in Green Bay in August is very different than the grass in Green Bay in December, right? I mean, there are environmental factors that play into this. So what I'm saying is we're trying to look at this in a very scientific and holistic way, understand what are the characteristics <coughs> of a surface that really seem to correlate with injury. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of data points. Uh, if you think about something like ACL injuries, to develop power and statistics of observation, you need a lot of that data. So we're actively developing new ways to test those surfaces and trying to make those correlations and, and look at it again from a biomechanics perspective. So I guess what I'd say to you is it's not just quite as easy as natural good, artificial bad. There are a lot more nuances to this, and we got a lot of work when, to do to understand it. When you it. say that to the Players Association, because obviously this is a matter of some debate right now, is there some understanding from the Players Association that you have a point, or do they just say, we want 32 or whatever it is, 30 fields with natural grass? Well, all these things are done collaboratively, Peter. We have what we call a joint surfaces committee where we have engineers from the NFL, engineers from the Players Association that work together. So the scientists who are doing and driving all this work are, are from both groups. And obviously we have a third party epidemiology company, IQVIA, that you're familiar with that also works with this. So again, I don't see this as an NFL or an NFL PA issue. I see this as a scientific challenge that we're really working hard to solve. And, and I think we're gonna make a lot of progress and have a lot more understanding, but I would just say it's, it's a lot more complex. And I, and I think my experience has been, Peter, when I sit down and have the conversation with somebody like you and explain all these different parameters, they go, wow, that's, that is a little more complicated than we ever thought it was. And, and obviously we got a lot more wood to chop there. Dr. Alan Sills, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Peter. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.